let's talk about child psychiatry now this topic is going to encompass the child from birth till they reach adulthood and for usml step 1 you need to know the different developmental milestones so i will go through this quickly this is done in pediatrics an infant once they are born they are able to imitate facial expressions they have crying and clinging behavior they have synchronized limb movements and they would reach and grasp and they have different preferences for large bright objects moving objects curves lines these won't be asked what will be asked is questions like uh, a baby with babinski reflexes 16 months after birth is this normal no it's not normal so let's talk about the motor functions there are different primitive reflexes the motor reflex will disappear by 3 months rooting by 4 months palmar reflex by 6 months and the babinski reflex by 12 months this has to be known posture the child is able to lift the head in a prone position by the first month and rolls and sits by the 6th month crawls by 8 months and stands by 10 months and finally walks by around 12 to 18 months they are able to pick and pass toys by 6 months most importantly it's essential to know this point the order in which they learn to copy shapes and this is simple to remember it's just alphabetical except for the diamond so diagonals are learned later circle by 3 months cross by 4 months rectangle by 4 and a half months square by 5 triangle diamond this is needed for usml step 1 and two social functions they will be smiling in social situations when there's people around and they are smiling they would the child would also smile and strange anxiety develops by 6 months this must be remembered a child that is under 6 months who cries on seeing a stranger this is normal development this point is very important because this will be tested in mcqs separation anxiety develops by 9 months another very important point verbal cognitive development they will orient to voice by 4 months then to name and gestures by 9 months they will understand that objects continue to exist even when they cannot be seen heard or sensed by 9 months and they would say mama or dada by 10 months in a toddler that is 1 year to 3 years of age they will take their first steps by 1 year climb stairs by 18 months and this is also very important the cube stacked will correspond to the number stacked age in years times 3 so a child who's 2 years will stack 6 bricks they will be able to self feed by 20 months and they would kick balls by 24 months in terms of social function they would parallel play within the second to third year that is one child sits and plays by his own and the other would either watch or play on his own they would move away and return to mother by 24 months they would also realize that there are different types of gender by 36 months no is their favorite word because that's the parents go to word whenever a child asks something you go no they would imitate others and they would recognize themselves in the mirror in terms of verbal and cognition this is very important for step 1 they would have a vocabulary of around 50 to 200 words by 2 years and they would use 300 plus words by 3 years this is also very important to remember because this will be tested in questions they will ask you a question where a child is able to speak let's say 100 words by 3 years and they will ask is this a language disorder or is there a specific disorder or is this normal development in terms of preschool age the motor skills will develop to a point where they would be able to drive a tricycle by the age of 3 copy lines circles or stick figures by 4 years and social functions includes staying away from the mother 
by three years. In the sense, they feel more comfortable with this. They would play with other children. This is no longer parallel play. And sometimes, and this is important, around the age of three, they might have imaginary friends. So they would talk to their imaginary friends. In terms of verbal and cognition, they would understand a thousand words by three years and use complete sentences and prepositions by four years. They would tell all sorts of detailed stories, all these stories by four years. By age five, they get complete sphincter control and they would dress and undress themselves. In terms of age five, they would get romantic feelings for others. But when you go to grade six, the uh, sorry, age of six to 12, these sexual feelings, okay, the romantic feelings would disappear. They would call, a boy would call out a girl or would not sit next to them or stay near them because they have girl cooties. This is a defense mechanism. They gradually become more organized in terms of sports and they would have more refined motor skills. They would ride bicycles, be able to ride properly and their coordination in general increases. Once they reach the age of 12 onwards, the growth spurt would start and sexual mat maturity becomes obvious. And from this age, remember this, identity is key. Everything they do for identity and everything they do is for identity. And one very important thing is we hear a lot of movies say everyone tries to be the same while in high school. But once you leave high school, everyone wants to be different. So while you are in school, everything you do is for conformity. But then after you leave high school, you realize it's not the popular girl's opinion that matters. It's your own individual self. Next, let's talk about brain growth spurts. And it's important to know that when the spurt is supposed to happen, if it doesn't happen, these skills cannot be gained later. For example, if a child does, does drugs, well, when they're in their 12, 13, 14 years of age, this will permanently affect brain growth. So this is the time when a baby or a child is most susceptible to the environment. There are different disorders related to brain growth spurts, such as low birth weight defects. And then we talked about some in learning disorders. They will also develop strange anxiety and separation anxiety. If the separation anxiety lasts more than four weeks in children and more than six months in adults, and is functionally impairing, then we call it a separation anxiety disorder. They will have a lot of lies to avoid going to school or to their social events. They would have headaches, stomach aches, nausea, whenever they know that the separation is about to occur or anticipated. And the separation is usually from home or from an attachment figure. This is a normal behavior till the age of three to four. And repeated nightmares involving the theme of separation is very common. The treatment should focus on interacting with the parents in the home setting and cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically you do family therapy. You try to make sure that the child understands that it is okay that there's nothing to be afraid of in a home sitting. You don't try to do that while the ch child goes to school. In the school, the child is already anxious. 
you need to do it at home next we have reactive attachment disorders this is found in children under the age of 5 when they have parents or other caretakers who do not care for the child and these children they will not seek or respond to comfort so this is a brain development disorder unless you intervene early the child will develop will consider this to be normal that will be the person's future also they will not seek or respond to comfort they will have unexplained irritability or fear they will get mad and have anger outbursts and they will have problems with toileting sleep difficulties anxiety a lot of aggression and hyperactivity again you should make sure that you intervene early to prevent the brain development from causing it to be permanent next let's talk about peripartum mood disturbances these are disturbances seen in a mother who just gave birth to a child there's three types that we need to know one is called the postpartum blues this is simply something this is very common it's seen in around 40 to 80 percent of newborn mothers and the onset this is very useful to diagnose between the three types is within two to three days it resolves in two weeks and you do not need to treat them they will present with mild depression they will be tearful they will be irritable and this is related to hormonal changes you need to reassure and you monitor to see if it might go into postpartum depression when we talk about postpartum depression this is less common and it occurs within four to six weeks and can be up to one year usually after the delivery of the second baby this will present with two or more weeks of depressive symptoms including suicide ideations so we learned the depressive disorders they will have no energy all those symptoms that we discussed will be present here and the treatment is antidepressants and psychotherapy next we have the postpartum psychosis this is a very rare condition you get it in 0.1 to 0.2 percent and the onset is variable within days to weeks and usually after the delivery of the first baby the mother would have had symptoms of okay the mother would have had bipolar or other mood affective disorders and the symptoms will be delusions hallucinations thought disorders bizarre behaviors and very importantly you need to know you do not leave the baby alone with the child because the mother might kill the child the treatment for postpartum psychosis is you need to hospitalize the patient you hospitalize the patient and then you go for antipsychotics antidepressants and mood stabilizers and the most effective therapy if these don't work out is you go for electroconvulsive therapy now when a mother is prescribed mood stabilizers such as lithium the breast breastfeeding should be stopped and started after the uh, stopping of treatment and you can screen depression in postnatal patients using this edinburgh postnatal depression scale it's not important next we have child developmental disorders now we talked about react uh, reactive attachment disorder in the previous slide uh, so i won't go into detail here but basically when you deprive a child of the love of the care then they will fail to thrive they would have poor language and socializing skills and would have a lack of basic trust next let's go into child abuse physical abuse whenever a child comes to the hospital and you find injuries in different stages of healing or fractures or bruises or burns which do not which cannot be explained by the child's caretaker 
then you need to call child services this is not something that you will let the you will not let the child be taken back home with the uh, caregiver you need to call child care services there could be subdural hematomas or retinal hemorrhages so you need to evaluate the baby further the child further and usually the caregivers may delay seeking medical attention because they know they will be in trouble next sexual abuse in a child children who exhibit sexual knowledge or behavior incongruent with their age that means if a, you don't expect a 5 year old child to know know everything about sex how it happens everything stis the presence of stis utis genital anal or oral trauma is indicative of sexual abuse and again this should be informed to the child support or child services and most often there are no physical signs because the abuser will most likely not abuse the child in a way that would lead to a lot of physical signs making it obvious that some uh, there was a lot there was sexual abuse next emotional abuse this is when the child lacks a bond with the caregiver but are overly affectionate with less familiar adults and emotional abuse is linked to a lot of serial cases histories next is child neglect again you need to report these for child protective services because when you don't provide the food with the, the child with adequate food shelter supervision education or affection then the child will have developmental disorders and you need to make sure that the child is protected by calling child protective services we talked about this uh, orders in which you need to call child protective services next we have vulnerable child syndrome this is when the parents are overly protective they think that their child is very susceptible to illness or injury this is not like factitious disorders imposed on others where they would actually go and create symptoms on the child and this is common after a severe illness or life threatening event to the child so the parents are worried about the child and they would go to the hospital instead of going to school because they think that something might be wrong with the child even if it was just sniffles next let's talk about discipline in child you need to understand children are egocentric that means they think that the world revolves around them not only children most people think that the world revolves around them you can't expect the child to understand how others feel and punishment is the best way to stop bad dangerous behaviors as it programs the child it conditions the child on what not to do it is also important to know that consequences should be connected in time and space you don't wait for the father to come home to punish the child you never tell okay once your father comes home you are in a lot of trouble this is not the way you change their behavior next we'll talk a bit about teenagers like i said identity is key and their values would reflect those of the parents that's why the schools would scold a child saying it, this shows how your parents behave and then rebellion is manifested as minor disagreements this is very common you can imagine a child who would rebel okay would go to school mad at the mother because the mother said do not wear your hair like this but on the way to school the hair is made up in the way she wants this is more common in early teenage years because they think that the parents don't understand parents are wrong all of this next we have aneurysms this is simply nighttime urinary incontinence which occurs more than two times a week for three months or more this is the diagnostic criteria this occurs in people older than 5 years now if you remember by 5 years aneurysms should stop 
and if it starts again there might be an underlying case of bullying so the treatment is behavioral modification such as nighttime fluid restriction and scheduled voids and positive reinforcement we have talked about this there is something called the bell pad which is simply a device which is attached to the child if it gets wet it will suddenly start ringing so this will wake the child up so that the child can finish off the uh, urination in a washroom instead of in bed if this is refractory to treatment then you can go for oral desmopressin this is a nasal drug or you can go for short term imipramine this is an oral drug next let's talk about attachment and loss this is high yield in usmle it will be tested especially the attachment and loss in adults when it comes to children if they are separated from their loved ones they will start to protest they will be in despair and feel detachment from their parents and it is important to know whenever a child is hospitalized when the parent is involved if the parent is always there with the child they will feel more secure they will feel more safe this translates to better outcomes in terms of uh, recovery next we have bereavement reactions in children what is bereavement reactions this is the reaction that would happen after death talkers it is important to know in a child under 6 years they will not understand that death is final and they would be under the assumption that they would come back to life or they would come back the next day once they are 7 years and older they are aware that death is final and th- this is also an important thing whenever death occurs and the child sees that the other people are crying they should be told that this is not because of them this is not the child's fault because of these egocentric thoughts in children they think the world revolves around them so whenever they see the people crying they would think that they did something wrong this is also common when handling divorce situations if you blame the child for the divorce the child will go into different stages of uh, developmental disorders you need to make sure that the child knows that the child is not to blame and that they still love the child this is a very important part for usmle step 1 and 2 normal grief is normal up to 1 year after that it is considered as complex grief or bereavement okay it is considered as prolonged grief crying decreased libido weight loss insomnia functional decline is less severe so all these symptoms will be seen with normal lead with normal to low functional decline they will go to their jobs even though they are sad they would use that as a way to block out the thoughts of the grief they are will be longing to see the loved ones and they may think they hear or see them in a crowd suicide ideation is rare and this is self limited and it usually lasts around 6 months this is the normal uh, time period in which normal grief occurs antidepressants are not helpful this will prolong grief because what you are doing is you simply uh, put a pause and the moment you stop the antidepressants it will restart again they need to go through the reaction and telling them grief is normal helps a lot when you consider depression there should be two or more weeks of depressive symptoms this would present same after some sort of an incident but there would be marked social and occupational dysfunction the person will not go out the person is unable to do their job properly and abnormal over identification with personality changes they think they are the cause behind this 
Suicide ideation is common as it is with depression. Symptoms do not stop. And in this case, antidepressants are helpful. Next, we have persistent complex bereavement disorder. This is prolonged grief longer than 12 months after the loss of a loved one. It is associated with unexpected or violent deaths of a loved one. So this is very important. There should be an unexpected or violent death. And then they think that they could have done something to stop that. There's a lot of guilt involved. And they cannot envision life without the loved ones. They won't move on. Suicide, suicide ideation is very common. And the symptoms may persist for years to decades unless it is treated. You need to treat them with psychotherapy. Rules for dealing with the dying. When it comes to a child, you need to tell the child everything. Explain to the child that the person is dying. Explain that they didn't do anything wrong. Because the child will obviously see the parents' depressed moods. They will see them crying and they will obviously know that something is wrong. And if the parents try to hide it, there will be a lot of separation. Do not give the child false hope. You can under promise and over deliver. But as a doctor, you cannot do that. You need to not actually promise anything. You should never promise a patient. Okay, I promise you will be better in a week they can use it against you and uh, you can fall in a lot of trouble you tell the facts you console but you never promise them and you should allow the person to talk about feelings when the when you know a person is dying don't let them be in bed don't restrict their movements don't tell them you are dying you should not be going out you should not be doing your job you should keep them involved in as many activities as they are able to. Because you never know how long they will live. Childhood and early onset disorders are similar to the ego defenses that we learned. Conduct disorder is very similar to antisocial personality disorder. Except we never diagnose a person who's over the age of 18 as conduct disorder and vice versa. So conduct disorder is before age of 18. This is when they infringe on the rights of others. They break rules. And after age of 18, if these symptoms persist, you call it antisocial personality disorder. Treatment is psychotherapy. The prognosis for children and adolescents is typically good. And they would grow out of their behavior before the age of 18. Next, we have disruptive mood dysregulation disorders. This is when there are recurrent, severe temper outbursts, which is out of proportion to the situation. Let's say you take a chocolate from them. They would shout, scream and everything, which will be obviously out of proportion of the situation. Onset is before the age of 10. Treatment is, again, cognitive behavioral therapy, antipsychotics, and stimulants. Next, we have oppositional defiant disorder. This is very important for your assembly. Symptoms must last at least six months. And they have patterns of anger and irritability. And they would be constantly arguing. They would take revenge. And they would have a lot of defiance towards adults and other authoritative figures. But it's important to know... This is not going to cause the child to break rules of society. In conduct disorder, the child would break rules of society. But oppositional defined disorder, these are just uh, really pissed off kids. They are not going to break, off, break rules, start fires, like in conduct disorders. Again, treatment is psychotherapy, which should include family counseling. Intellectual disability, we already did this. Selective mutism. These people, these children, they do not talk in certain situations only. So let's say 
they will talk at home they will talk fine at home but the moment they go to school they don't talk and their development is typically not impaired this would coexist with another social anxiety disorder then separation anxiety disorder which we also discussed specific learning disorder we already did in learning disorders let's take a look at the case study we have a 17 year old boy who's brought to the office by his mother and school officials for evaluation of his behavior the mother reports that he's failing most of his classes he has skipped school regularly since the fourth grade and frequently lies to his mother about his whereabouts he refuses to do any homework because it's a waste of time he has been suspended several times for fighting and was once caught setting off the school fire bell the patient uses glue alcohol and once even tried cocaine his mother reports he often stays out past curfew and has come home intoxicated a few times the patient appears angry about being brought to the appointment he argues with his mother throughout the examination and his responses to the physician are short and sarcastic which of the following is the most likely explanation for this patient's behavior since this is a child who's under the age of 18 this is a conduct disorder if the child was over the age of 18 the diagnosis would be antisocial personality disorder if the child was just having anger outbursts we would go for intermittent explosive disorders a 13 year old boy is brought to the office by his mother she expresses concerns about the child's behavior and says that he is stubborn irritable overly emotional and does not listen he would disrupt his brother when he's doing his own thing he never listens when i tell him to do chores or go to sleep the mother also says that he, she has had several calls from school saying that the child would talk back to the teacher and skip classes which of the following is the most likely diagnosis compare this boy with the boy above is this boy as badly behaved as the one above no this is not a conduct disorder obviously not a antisocial personality disorder this is a case of oppositional defiant disorder next we have an 18 year old boy who was brought to the office by his mother the mother says since moving to a new school 7 months ago he started talking to an imaginary friend he hasn't done this since kindergarten he used to cry a lot when i dropped him off but the imaginary fr friend was always a big comfort for him the mother also notes that her son has been spending more time alone and when passing by his bedroom she can sometimes hear him laughing and talking to his friends his teachers have said that the patient has not been paying attention in class or completing homework the patient reports no depressed mood sleep and ang appetite are normal vital signs everything is normal on mental status examination the patient avoids eye contact and has a flat affect now let's take a look at these important points again we have an 18 year old boy with a history of 7 months of symptoms the diagnosis here is schizophrenia the important point i need to highlight here was schizophrenia is a disorder that can occur even in children Next, we have a 23-year-old woman who's brought due to depression and difficulty caring for their 3-week-old child. This was their first child. The husband came home from work and found the patient staring at the wall and mumbling to herself while the baby cried in his crib. From the three disorders that we know about postpartum disorders, is this postpartum blues, postpartum depression, or postpartum psychosis which seems to be most likely the patient is exhausted because the baby keeps her up all night she admits to hearing voices the patient has a history of bipolar disorder she does not take medication she did not take medication during the pregnancy due to concerns about the effect on the fetus because lithium is associated with a lot of congenital birth disorders including epstein abnormality on mental status examination the patient is alert and speaks soft and slowly her mood is depressed and her affect is blunted at one point she stares into space and mumbles something before turning to the doctor and saying i am a 
terrible mother. I think about killing the child. The patient does not have any suicide ideation. Which of the following is the most appropriate cause of action? This is obviously a case of postpartum psychosis. And you need to make sure that you hospitalize the patient. Also, you don't let the child stay with the mother. We have a 23-year-old woman who comes for a routine four-week postpartum visit following an uncomplicated vaginal liver. She says the baby is adorable, but I worry about being a good mother. She tearfully describes feeling exhausted and unable to return to sleep after getting up in the middle of the night to feed the baby. She says the baby cries all the time and nothing I do helps. I tried to breastfeed, but I gave it up because she was fussy and I was afraid I wasn't, she wasn't getting enough to eat. I am up even though I have very little energy at night because I can't sleep. The patient has little time to care for herself and has been eating poorly. She feels increasingly depressed. The patient says, everyone expects me to be happy, but it has been so hard. I don't deserve to be a mother. The patient has no psychiatric history and has no, no thoughts of hurting the baby. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? This is not postpartum blues. You need to prescribe an antidepressant and schedule outpatient follow-up for this patient. This is a case of postpartum depression. A 38-year-old woman comes to the office accompanied by her friend who is concerned that she is depressed. The woman says that since her husband's unexpected death four years ago, she seems withdrawn and socially isolated. The patient reports that she still misses her husband terribly. It has been four years and thinks about him constantly. She says, I can't believe that he's gone. She feels guilty that she did not recognize his heart condition and blames herself for not insisting that he get medical care earlier. This is an unexpected death and the patient feels like she could have done something about it. The patient does not have any sleep or appetite disturbances but sleeps on the couch because she can't bear to lie in the bed that she and her husband shared. There is no suicide ideation. Which of the following is the most likely explanation of this patient's symptoms? This is persistent complex bereavement disorder. The death occurred four years ago. She is withdrawn and these are the Typical symptoms that is seen in this disorder. A six-year-old boy is brought to the office by his foster mother for evaluation of behavioral concerns. The patient was placed in with the foster mother five months ago by social services due to physical abuse and neglect by his parents. So he was taken by his parents because they did not care for him and they would physically abuse the child. His teacher is concerned that he does not follow directions rarely participates during group activities and does not respond to praise. The foster mother says he seems to get up, upset for no reason and usually starts throwing and breaking things. This is out of proportion. I'm trying my best and I want him to know that he's loved but I feel like nothing I do helps. Vital signs are normal. He makes contact, eye contact and answers questions briefly before turning away to play by himself. Affect is indifferent with constricted range. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? This is a typical case of reactive attachment disorder. We have a four-year-old boy who is brought to the office by his foster mother for evaluation of behavioral concerns. The patient was placed with the foster mother five months ago by social services due to physical abuse and neglect by his parents. His teacher is concerned that he does not follow directions, rarely participates during group activities and does not respond to praise. The foster mother says he seems to get upset for no reason at times and usually starts throwing and breaking things. I am trying my best and I want him to know his love but I feel like nothing I do helps. Vital signs are within normal limits. Physical examination shows no abnormalities. He makes eye contact and answers questions briefly before turning away to play by himself. Affect is with constricted range. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? In an autism spectrum disorder patient, they would rarely make eye contact and 
physical abuse will not be part of the case study that they would present in the exam. This is a typical case of reactive attachment disorder. The onset is before the age of five. There is insufficient care by parents or other caretakers. They do not seek or respond to comfort. He does not care about this. And there is unexplained irritability. He starts throwing temper. Uh, te he gets mad and starts throwing things.